We are moving on to continue the causes of the Protestant Reformation. You already have the three examples of the crisis that hurt the prestige of the clergy uh, and the Roman Catholic Church as a whole. And now we're moving on to our second cause, which is corruption in the Catholic Church. So remember to use both of these parts of your typed outline to continue on with section one, Roman numeral one of the Protestant Reformation. With our second cause of the Protestant Reformation, we're looking at examples of the corruption in the Catholic Church um, that was taking place for, some would argue, a number of years. The first example of corruption within the Catholic Church was simony. If you practice simony, it means you are selling church offices or office positions. So for example, the Pope was selling offices or office positions to unqualified people who would then become a bishop or a cardinal, which is a major leadership position in the Catholic Church. And so this was outraging people that there were unqualified individuals who were working uh, within the church and being paid to do it. Some would pronounce it simony, so simony, simony, you know, however you want to pronounce it. All right, the second example of corruption is pluralism. Plural, pluralism is like simony, but it is different with you having two positions or offices at one time. Okay, so when an official within the church is holding uh, two positions or offices at one time, this is pluralism. Well, we all know that you can't really be in two places at once, so you will see the practice of absenteeism as a third example of corruption in the Catholic Church. With absenteeism, you have an individual not participating in the benefice, but receiving payments and privileges. So what this tells us is you have someone who is not performing their duties in one of their positions, but they're still getting paid and they're still getting the privileges from that position. So again, this is what we call absenteeism. They're not present in their position to perform their duties, but they're still getting paid and getting those privileges. Another example of corruption, and this is the big one that you're gonna hear the most about, uh, the sale of indulgences. So with the sale of indulgences, here's what was happening. People paid the church to absolve their sins or even the sins of their loved one. So what was happening is you're basically getting a get out of free card to purgatory. The Catholics believed that when you die, that you go to uh, not straight to heaven or hell, but basically an in-between, which is called purgatory, where you are judged for what you did during your life. And it is there a decision is made on whether you're going to go on to heaven or hell. So some can spend a long time in purgatory, you know, being judged. And so what the church is basically saying is you can bypass purgatory and go straight to hopefully heaven. So the sale of indulgences was a major criticism and example of corruption within the Catholic Church that you're going to hear more about whenever we start talking about Martin Luther. Our next example of corruption is nepotism. Y'all have heard this word before. That is when you favor family members in the appointment of church offices. So that was definitely going on uh, according to some within the Catholic Church. Moral decline of the papacy is another example of corruption, and this is when we have certain popes and priests that are involved in sexual affairs. You have to remember 
that whether you're a pope, a priest, a bishop, a cardinal, any of those leaders within the Catholic Church, you have taken vows. And part of these vows is you are basically devoting your entire life to God in the church. And you're not supposed to participate in certain activities, such as marriage um, and having relations with others. So the moral decline of the papacy, again, is another example of the corruption within the Catholic Church. And then we have clerical ignorance. Uh, we know that many priests were virtually illiterate. And so uh, this, of course, will be an outrage because so many people rely on the church for their information. So when you have priests who can't even read, um, that, of course, doesn't make the church look good at all because those are your teachers. We now have several examples of corruption within the Catholic Church, and now we're going to move on to actual critics of the church. So if you look at your number three on your typed outline, these critics of the Roman Catholic Church emphasized a personal relationship with God as primary. To understand that, you have to once again understand uh, the doctrine of the Catholic Church and that at the time period that we're studying, um, which again, we're kind of doing some things prior to the Reformation for you to understand why the Reformation actually takes place, uh, the Catholic Church was the ultimate authority and everyone did what the Catholic Church told them to do. So when the Catholic Church said, you need to come to our services, uh, and that is how you are going to have a, a relationship with God. You did it, okay? You're not staying at home and having that one-on-one -on -one time, you know, in prayer, for example. You needed to go to church and worship with everyone else, and that's where you would have your relationship. Well, these critics that we're about to go over um, did not necessarily believe that you had to be within the Catholic Church in order to have a personal relationship with God. Um, that you could actually, you know, be in the privacy of your own home and still have some of the same elements. One of those individuals is John Wycliffe. Notice when he was around, well before the Reformation, which will be in the 1500s. He was English, and he stated that the Bible was the sole authority. So if it was in the Bible, then you could take it at its word. If someone is saying something that cannot be found in the Bible, then it may not necessarily be true, according to Wycliffe. He stressed that personal communion with God. Again, he's one that doesn't believe you have to use the church as a go-between um, you know, it was like a middleman in order to get to God personally, that you can have that personal relationship. He diminished the importance of the sacraments. Again, if you know anything about the Catholic Church, they, they believe in seven uh, holy sacraments, and he does not believe in all seven of them. We also know he translated the Bible into English so that more people could read and understand the Bible. Remember, the Bible was written in many different languages. You have Hebrew, you have Latin, and not everyone can read those scholarly languages. So he wanted to make sure more people had access uh, to the Bible and be able to read it, so it was translated into English. Wycliffe's followers, and he had many of them, were called Lollards, and that's just because they would mumble their prayers. You would almost hear them sounding like they were saying, lo, 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 and, and they were, again, kind of just mumbling their prayers, and so that's where the word Lollard came from. So as you can see here, John Wycliffe's information, very important as an example of a critic of the Catholic Church. So being this English scholar, he really believed 
that the church should only follow scripture, like I said up here, that the Bible uh, be the sole authority, because not all church decisions were being made according to the Bible, and so that was a big issue for Wycliffe. Um, he also didn't like how the Catholic Church was really fancy, you know, like the, the priests would have to wear the robes, um, and only the leaders were allowed to take uh, communion instead of the laity. We know that changes later down the road, um, but um, they had specific rules, again, that Wycliffe did not agree with. Our next example of a critic of the Catholic Church who was before the Reformation, again, you can see here by the years, we know he was before the Reformation took place, was Jan Hus. And he was actually from uh, Bohemia, which is modern day Czech Republic. Okay? There in Bohemia, he led a nationalist movement. You have to understand that he was greatly influenced by Wycliffe, okay, because again, he is going to um, kind of come around right after the time of Wycliffe. So in Bohemia, he led this uh, national movement. We know that his ideas are very similar to Wycliffe uh, in that he thought that the Catholic Church was just too formal or too fancy uh, and needed to be a little bit more simple with their uh, worship services. So what makes him different from Jan Hus is the fact that he didn't just stay in his own country and voice these concerns that he had about the church, uh, like what Wycliffe did. He just stayed in England, you know, and voiced these, these um, issues. Hus went to Rome and he actually uh, attended that Council of Constance meeting that we talked about where a fourth pope was elected to end the Great Schism. And unfortunately, while he was at the Council of Constance, he was voicing his concerns. And because of that, he will be labeled a heretic. A heretic, for those of you that do not know, is someone who does not follow the teachings of the church. And so clearly Huss is being labeled as a heretic and the punishment for that is being burned alive at the stake. So we can see here that that is exactly what happens to Huss. Now his followers are referred to as Hussites and they are going to stage rebellions um, you know, long after Huss died to try to keep his uh, cause alive and to spread his message. Make sure you wrote this down right. I just realized that the picture was covering up some of that. So these Hussites staged large rebellions in the 14th century. So clearly um, that was during the time of Huss as well as they will continue these uh, rebellious acts even after Huss's death. So it is during his life as well as after. Our next critic is someone you all are familiar with, Erasmus. So I just wanted to remind you that his best-selling book, In Praise of Folly, was a criticism of the corruption within the Catholic Church and the hypocrisy of the clergy. So this is something you already know that I just want to make sure that you have written down for the current chapter we're studying on the Reformation. Don't forget the famous quote said by some of the contemporaries of the time, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. So we know that there were some things going on within the church that Erasmus didn't like. Uh, a lot of it was, um, you know, immoral behaviors. Uh, there was some hypocrisy going on with the teachings. And so he's going to set the stage that will allow for Martin Luther to come and begin the actual Reformation. I'm going to end this video so I can get ready for the next one. And we are wrapping up. Uh, Roman numeral 1 in the next video and beginning Roman numeral 2 on Martin Luther.